Hello, everyone. Um, folks are just coming and getting settled in, and we'll get started in just a second. Um, since these are short programs, we'll just we'll give it another you know 10, 15 <laughs> seconds to, to, to let people come in. Um, I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships at the Wharton Escherich Museum. Uh, thrilled to have you today for this virtual spotlight talk. These are 15 minute talks on a narrow topic. We don't usually have the chance to cover in depth on a museum tour with some time for questions at the end. So thrilled to have you here with us today. Um, today, we're gonna be looking at some architectural drawings and blueprints that are either in WEM's collection or currently on view, as well as a couple of other places you can find great images of the buildings on WEM's campus in formation. It's not going to be a complete overview of everything that's on site at WEM or out in the world, and we won't really go into depth on any one document, but you'll have a chance to get a sense of the museum's holdings, see some newer discovery. You know, these are the kinds of ideas and objects that you'll have the chance to explore in depth through offerings like our In the Works architecture focused tours of the site, um, which are, are going to be really, really, truly exciting. And um, in some of the programming that is scheduled throughout our anniversary year. Um, I just want to start with a quick housekeeping note first, if you can go to the next slide. to let you know that, that I hope you'll all join us for programs this May, including Home Improvement, which is a partnership between the Historic Artists Homes and Studios and the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Um, we're paired in this conversation with the team from the Winslow Homer Studio at the Portland Museum of Art in Portland, Maine, to discuss the future of historic home and studio preservation and interpretation. Uh, we'll have some preservation uh, presentations that will conclude with questions and group dialogue and keep your eyes out for our next spotlight talk in May, uh, which will focus on the actual construction and building of the Eshrick studio. And I know that date will be sent to you as a follow up to this presentation. Um, I'll ask folks to mute themselves if they haven't yet and let everyone know that that a couple of my one colleagues are here today, including Larissa Huff, who is going to be able to answer questions in the chat or uh, deal with any uh, things that might come up as we're going through the presentation. So thank you for, for helping out today, Larissa. Okay, if we can go to the next one. So today, of course, we're, we're sort of one step before the building phase that's going to be the focus of the conversation as we, uh, in our next spotlight talk, we're going to be looking at some architectural drawings and blueprints for a conversation that's been prompted by our current installation, Home is Sight, which is on view now through May 15th, 2022. I'm showing an image on the right here of the installation in the visitor center, which explores how the physical nature and architecture of the WEM campus has changed over the years. Um, how Eshrick's original ideas morphed and changed and allowed for this series of creations and recreations of home. And in this installation, we've got images with um, a blueprint or two from the museum's collection, as well as some other materials on view. Um, if you can go to the next one. You know, we're, we're lucky that for the early days of both Sunnycrest and the studio, we don't have architect well so we're not lucky that we don't have architectural images or blueprints on hand but we are real lucky that we have wonderful artistic and photographic images depicting these sites so two of which i'm showing here um you know because sunny crest was a pre-existing structure the initial studio was built without blueprints or you know really the oversight of a trained architect making detailed technical drawings, something that were outside of the scope of the material produced during the process of the construction. But we have images like up on the hill, the woodcut from 1927, um, where you get this view up to the studio through the trees. And then of course, this um, photograph from the late 1920s showing the studio and garage. You know, we also know of documents like Eshrick's writing, uh, I build a building or he helps me build a building, which is an unpublished essay that was done about building the site at the encouragement of Eshrick's close friend, the writer Theodore Dreiser, to give a sense of the, the studio's earliest beginnings. And you know, to quote 
with, uh, to quote that piece, it begins to start with, we must have a piece of land through a wood or an old worn path, a path buried in briar and brush, but it still stands as evidence of padding feet. I went through the path to a clearing, saw several trees, which I imagined should be sheltering a roof. There it started. So not quite the technical um, uh, specifications of a blueprint, but something quite a bit more romantic. You can go to the next. In contrast, we're lucky enough to have a series of blueprints for the 1956 workshop that detail the collaboration between Eshrick and the architects, Louis Kahn and Ann Ting. I'm showing here blueprint one for the concrete block and stucco workshop from Kahn's office. This is a two-dimensional drawing that offers detailed visual representation of several aspects of the workshop site, including dimensions, an aerial view of the honeycomb structure of the site, how the new structure would abut the earlier garage, as well as construction materials and specifications and placements of all of the components. Um, it's worth noting that Ting's name is absent on the blueprint, right? This came from the Khan office, but we know that Ting was instrumental in bringing her complex geometry drawn from nature into her collaborations with Khan. And I can't recommend our recent spotlight talk on Ting enough, which hopefully uh, someone can link to in the follow-up email here. You can go to the next image. So Wem's collection includes a series of con blueprints for the property, um, each of which shows different aspects of the site and is designed to share with different co contributors to the project, ranging from contractors to fabricators to the client. This is, uh, you, you'll notice in the bottom right corner that each of these have a number of them. So we were looking at blueprint number one before, now we're looking at number seven. Um, if you can go to the next one. So these documents would have been used to estimate the costs of labor and the bill of materials to create a construction schedule, obtain building permits. WEM's archive have interesting documentation of that process, including um, a relatively recently <laughs> uncovered letter from 1955 from Khan seeking an estimate for a heating system based off of blueprints one and two. Um, also recently uncovered in our archives are receipts detailing the materials used in various jobs to construct the workshop. And so we're excited to dig into this a little bit more and really learn from from these blueprints um, and, and hope that other you know, folks with an interest in architecture will, will access these materials as well. If you can go to the next one. This clip from the larger blueprint of the studio focuses on a plan view drawing. So this bird's eye view of the site structure from above of the ceiling of the workshop parsing out the roof plan. I'm showing um, this with an image showing the realization of this plan view during the construction of the workshop ceiling, as well as an aerial view of the workshop ceiling prior to replacing the shingles with the current copper roof. And so you can see here where they've noted um, uh, hopes for a skylight alongside the shingles and then the, the reality on, on the other uh, images. If we go to the next image, we have this clip from a larger blueprint, which focuses on an elevation view, drawing of the vertical plane depicting how a building will look when viewed from the front, back, left, or right side. So we've got an exterior elevation of the south side of the building here shown against an image of the southern facade of the workshop while it was under construction in 1956. Um, and then if we can go to the next image, We've got that, that Southern facade closer to its original date of completion. I wanted to include this image here because you can really use the blueprint to sort of see what stayed and what uh, uh, you know, changed along the way. But also, you know, if you pay attention to the, the sort of sculptures and objects that have been placed in the window here, and then we can go to the next image. I sort of love them against this, this visionary drawing of the workshop that's part of the uh, Khan archive, uh, the collections at the University of Pennsylvania, which houses the entire professional archives um, from Khan's architectural office, where we can see the sort of original visionary renderings of these windows, you know, complete with objects, with sculptures, sort of thinking about the windows as, as a site for, for display. Um, this perspective sketch, Bicon from 1955 really 
augments the more technical rendering that's offered by the blueprint. So they sort of work together to give a sense of what the eventual building is going to be. You can go to the next one. You know, these are images that are also from the University of Pennsylvania's Khan archive show this additional perspectival rendering and an elevation study with detail sketches for furniture on the interior of the space. Um, and so together with the blueprints, again, we get this sense of what the site should feel like as well as practical information on the needs for its realization. I, you know, these are interesting for how they are set within the landscape in particular. If we can go to the next. So some of the blueprints that we have access to that depict the workshop in construction feature section views, like the one I'm showing on the left here. So we've got this drawing on a vertical plane that slices through solid space to depict the inside of a certain section of a structure. This is a section view of the workshop from drawing one that includes typical constructions for, for wall sections. On the right, I'm showing a blueprint that's part of several in our archival collections, depicting the construction of and renovations for the Curtis Bach House in Gulf Mills, Pennsylvania, for which Eshrick created you know, this ambitious suite of architectural woodwork elements. You can go to the next one. And I'm showing here um, on the left, another blueprint of the Bach House that's in Wem's collection alongside a period photograph of the exterior. And one of Eshrick's, um, uh, you know, Eshrick would eventually be working on the interior spaces here. Bach purchased the home, which is on 13 acres in the late 1920s from the marble and porter Edward C. Jacoby, who had the house designed by the Philadelphia firm Savory and Sheets. Hence why you see these names on the blueprint in the lower right hand corner. Um, house was completed in 1925, but Eshrick's work on the interiors began a decade later and was completed in 1938, right? So we've got Eshrick here in his own personal holdings, has the blueprints for this building uh, sort of as it was created, as he's thinking about what, what he is going to do on the other side of that. And if you can go to the next image. This is a blueprint showcasing the interior plan prior to Eshrick's involvement, uh, as well as some images here of Eshrick's work in situ before the Bach house was demolished in 1989. Um, you know, many of these elements that I'm showing here, of course, are now at the Philadelphia Museum of Art or the Wolfsonian Museum in Florida. Um, blueprints like these and those that Khan created for the workshop can be found in other archives, right? We are not the only repository for images like this, but having Eshrick's copies of these blueprints in our collection allows us to take a close look at one of the tools that Eshrick may have been working with as he envisioned what could be in these spaces, which I think is part of what's so exciting about, about having them as a part of our holdings. If you can go to the next slide. I'm showing here, um, you know, an architectural uh, drawing. Uh, so a couple of different things on the left, we've got this sort of, I just wanted to zoom in on, on that first Bach house blueprint. Um, because I don't know if folks can see that the architect of record who's listed there is Joseph Eshrick Jr. Right, so this is Eshrick's nephew, a renowned architect who uh, co-founded and taught at the University of California Berkeley's College of Mental De Environmental Design for almost 40 years. Um, Joseph Eshrick grew up in Philadelphia, began learning from Wharton Eshrick at an early age, working with him on objects for the Bach House after graduating with his BA in architecture from the University of Pennsylvania in 1937. So, you know, I love here that on this 1937 blueprint, we have Joseph, who's just graduated from the University of Pennsylvania as, as the architect of, of record. Um, that middle image here with Wharton Eshrick and Joseph Eshrick maneuvering the music room's north windowsill timber around 1936, so just about when these plans would have been done. And then one of the, the pieces that we do have in um, uh, the installation that's up in through the middle of May are plans for the studio, the second level, that have been annotated in, in red pen with some notes from Joseph Eshrick. So clearly there was, there was a sort of back and forth between uncle and nephew in some interesting ways. You can go to the next. 
you know, our architects, our archives also include a blueprint for the Pennsylvania Hill House designed by the Philadelphia architect George Howe for the 1939-1940 New York World's Fair. Here, a total of 16 architects and designers were commissioned for the America at Home display, each creating their own room. Um, after Howe was invited, he of course extended that invitation to Eshrick, proposing a Pennsylvania Hill House as a space built around Wharton's work. Um, there is a whole spotlight talk just on this, but, but I'm showing here the blueprint because it provides this sort of interesting comparison to look at an image like this, which details the space in which es Eshrick's work was cited alongside images of the, the finished product. And of course, you can see the spiral staircase sort of pride of place that is, of course, a central feature of the Escherich studio and how they're envisioning um, the sort of plan and the space around it as they're thinking about the sort of schematic layout of the space here. Um, you know, how connected Escherich to Khan. And so in many ways, this blueprint is an interesting precursor to those we've already viewed for the, the workshop. And if we can go next to next. So I wanna close just quickly with some architectural sketches related to our campus plan, which um, I'm showing here. I hope that many of you were able to make it to our Creatives on Escher conversation with Sam Olshin and Lisa Dustin from Atkin Olson Shade Architects. And I think Sam is actually, I think I saw his face here today <laughs> for, for this little talk um, where they both spoke in depth about the research and design process for, for the museum's expanded campus plan. Um, and you're seeing here that sort of aerial view of uh, rendering of what, what that would look like once there is a new visitor center built on the campus uh, down near Sunnycrest. Um, if you can go to the next. So I may be surprising Sam here. Well, we're not yet at the blueprint stage for this project. We're really lucky enough to have Sam, some of Sam's wonderful images depicting the design process. And so I think about these in relationship to those wonderful, um, you know, kind of con visionary sketches, right? So Sam, um, presciently loaned his moleskin notebook with design sketches and ideas and notes for the project at WEM and for some other sites to the HOMA site installation. And it really gives a sense of the different ways that this project looked as the fact finding process was ongoing. So I'm showing here um, notes and a sketch from 2019. And this is the image that's been on view in the installation until yesterday. I've just changed that just to, to rotate <laughs> give it a little some light to a different image if we can go to the next one. These are some sketches from about seven months later, um, which seem to be in greater alignment with uh, some of the color renderings that Sam and AOS was generous enough to loan us for, for the installation that are on view at WEM right now. So um, really interesting to, to think about how the sort of sketching and the process has changed over the course of um, that discovery, that research process. Something went wrong. If you can go to the next image. So I wanna end here with, um, you know, these, these wonderful drawings, watercolors that are in the HOMA site installation. Um, so we've got the shape of the proposed building um, for the visitor center inspired by Eshrick's own formal language. And there are these visual nods to the angular asymmetry of the studio's benches and stair treads. Um, you know, we've got this wonderful image for the, the concept sketch that has this summation of Eshrick's values around uh, making, you know, utilitarian as sculpture. I don't know if people can, can read this in the bottom right. Angular, prismatic, and curvilinear, hand-built, expressionist in form and purpose, joyful expression, bridge the gap between art and craft. And so in this architectural sketch, we learn a lot about um, not only the way that the, the sort of thinking for the building has been going and the visuals of it, but also how the research process has supported that, that construction and design. And I'm really thrilled uh, that architectural scholars a hundred years down the line will have such a clear sense of what Sam was thinking during this exploratory process. Um, you know, just as we invite folks to come and use our archives 
to come and take a look at these blueprints um, to sort of learn from from what we what we have in our archives. This kind of documentation doesn't just you know provide client clarity, but also allows for potential future scholarship and inquiry. So. Um, I'm thrilled to sort of give you this very broad introduction to some of the blueprints and architectural drawings we have in the collection. And I think we have a couple of moments for questions if anyone if anyone has any, or in case uh, Sam wants to add anything, considering that he's on the call today. <laughs> Emily, this is Mark Letalian. Thank you for a great presentation. I worked with Joseph Eschrick in the last mm. eight years of his life in San Francisco, and I guess I never knew that the Bach House had been demolished. Can you share a little bit about what happened? Yeah, it's a so sad story. It is. It is a sad story. You know, save for the fact that um, really important pieces of of Eschrick woodwork ended up in public collections, and I would um, direct you. There's a really wonderful article that we can link to after the presentation today um, uh, that details the whole process of the deinstallation and the demolition of the site. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it, is a, it is a sad story and it's a big part of Joseph, Joseph Eshrick's story. So um, we're glad we at least have the, the process of the deinstallation and the reinstallation well documented. Thank Emily, you. it's uh, Mark Cooper. What what replaced the Bach residence that caused it to be demolished? That I don't know. I'm wondering if maybe Julie or Larissa have a sense of that. It's my understanding that it was the uh, the parcel was bought by a developer, uh, and they probably put just awful <laughs> houses that looked like one another there. Yeah, I thought it was the Blue Root expansion. Oh. Oh, either, then, either either way, it is not a magnificent. Uh, no. uh, <laughs> Sam, where, do you remember where you where you saw that? Uh, I can dig it up. It's either the Blue Root expansion, an off ramp, or a right of way for the Blue Root is my recollection. Okay. Yeah. Let me know. I'd love to know that for sure. Okay. And and we'll link we'll link to the to the actually the article by by David Demisio. We'll link to that in the follow up email, but it's also available on the online resources for educators um, uh, component of the museum's website. Well, if there aren't other questions, I'll encourage folks to come back for more um, sort of architecture related programming. A lot of the materials that we've mentioned today are things that have come to WEM just within the last couple of years or have been sort of uncovered slightly more recently. And so we're really excited about the opportunities that they hold for folks who want to do scholarship around the architectural makings of um, our site and also, you know, how Eshrick would have conceptualized projects and, and would have collaborated with architects. <laughs>